Following up on my love of mecha anime, besides Amaim, Muzz Love Alternative has also premiered this fall season with a pretty awesome banger of a first episode. The episode did suffer from some of the same issues that I mentioned in my review of Amaim, um, in that it really opens up with this deep narration slash exposition dump and timeline of events to set up the scene and build up the world as you're going um, into the first episode. The first episode really um, serves much as a prelude to what the story is actually going to be about, but and it actually doesn't even really introduce us to our main characters. Um, you know, it introduces us to a character in which we live through this really fierce and intense battle. It really sets up just how, um, I want to say, uh, aggressive and, you know, overwhelming the beta, which are the extraterrestrial life lords that are pretty much invading the Earth in Japan, are. Like, like a lot of this first episode and the battle slash skirmish that we see and the hopelessness and the civilians dying and all this stuff that happens really reminded me of a lot of great sci-fi movies like Starship Troopers, etc., where you see these soldiers' boots on the ground trying to fight the beta, and they can't. Now, this is a mecha anime because in in the world, um, the world, as you find out from the exposition dump, has kind of developed mechas in order to fight the beta because there are some which are considered, I think, like Titan class or something like that, where they're essentially really, really big betas. And I'm uh, saying beta is kind of funny to me. Um, they they can essentially pretty much withstand almost all ammunition. There's different classes of them. There's some that they call the soldiers. There are some that they call, um, I can't remember the other, um, but they can actually shoot like these laser beams that can blow everything up. It's really, really intense, um, um, this first episode, which is quite the contrast because when you start the first episode, you know, it's an exposition dump and you're introduced to um, our character, uh, Komaki Sayako, as she's transferred into this military unit that's really kind of like this last wall of defense um, for Japan in terms of keeping the betas out and not having Japan fall. If this falls, then the rest of Japan will essentially be consumed. And it, the, the episode starts off kind of slow paced. You're getting to know everybody, you know, um, Sayako is talking to other soldiers who are in her platoon, just kind of, you know, like there's like, like it's very chill and you see some of the civilians enjoying their lives. And then the second half of the episode, it's just death, destruction, sadness, and just overall, just uh, inex not a, I don't even want to say inexplicable loss because the loss here is just that, they weren't strong enough. Uh, they didn't have enough forces. It, it really feels like resistance fall of man. Um, that being said, the episode does use a little bit of CGI um, from the monsters, and sometimes they can look good, sometimes they can look a little cheesy, but I actually didn't mind it as much. Um, but going back to my review, I took a huge sidetrack there. Um, I want to say, like I said, um, there is an exposition dump of the timeline of events to set the scene and build up the world as you're going into the first episode. It differs in that Muv Love Alternative doesn't open with the uh, in-media res event like um, Amame does. Um, instead, it starts off with the world-building narration, much like a Gundam series would. If you're familiar, if you're unfamiliar with Muv Love as a franchise, I think that this opening segment is great because it sets up the threat and the state of the world. That's why um, I believe the episode is called like the state of the world. Uh, Love Love is a sci-fi franchise that began as a visual novel in 2003, so this is a very old franchise, um, very unique. I think the visual novel is actually made by one person. Um, I believe that it's also a trilogy of visual novel games that you can buy on Steam. I think they might be on PlayStation. I know there was a Kickstarter back in 2015 or 2016 to bring the visual novel to PS Vita. I'm not sure if it was successful or not, though, but the games are on Steam, um, quite a few of them, and they're very held in high regard. I haven't ever played them myself, but I would love to. I'm just not really into visual novels. Um, they're not my, my jam. Uh, but anyways, changing um, the tone of the series kind of changed as the uh, trilogy kind of began. And I'm going to quote Wikipedia on this one. The, tri the trilogy's story initially presents itself as a lighthearted romantic comedy in Muv Love Extra, but changes into an alternative timeline coming of age story in Muv Love Unlimited and finally involves into an alien invasion war epic, which is Muv Love Alternative. Um, Muv Love Alternative is the first time in the series that we have ever gotten an anime adaptation. I believe the series has had manga adaptations. Um, I think that they really picked a good piece of work to adapt into an anime because of the fact that it's going to be so action-packed and full of a lot of consequences and death and such. And uh, Muv Love as a franchise, I believe, um, 
the last one alternative like actually is kind of like a time loop story in a way like basically from what i read is that alternative actually takes us back to before unlimited and kind of changes a lot of the stuff um so meaning that you know you can just play this one or not play this one you can watch this anime and just have like a very self-contained um story since it's the last one in the trilogy you don't need to know anything before that at least i don't think um, which brings me to my next point, which is that you know, whether or not the story stays faithful or not to the source material, um, I hope that fans of the game will tell me in the comments. But so far, the first episode was really good and engaging, but again, not without its faults. While the first episode serves mostly as a prelude to the main story, it sets up the events that will lead us into the main story and main characters. But the biggest issue is that we don't see that with this first episode, meaning that with the way that the episode ends, we still aren't introduced to the main cast. And I think that that's a very risky gamble for people like me who have never played the games and don't really know what the series is about. You know, you're looking at the the thumbnail for the series, you know, like the promotional material and you're, you know, you know what the main characters look like, but you haven't seen them yet. And you just watch the first episode, but the first episode is so good at setting up the world and kind of showing you just how dire the situation is that you're just like, all right, I'm ready for this. I can definitely watch this. Um, especially since you do kind of have a main character in Komaki Sayoko, who you experience this intense battle with. Now, the marketing summary for the anime is as follows. In 1973, the invasion of an extraterrestrial life form, the Beta, began a war that has driven mankind to the brink of extinction. In an attempt to counter the Beta's overwhelming strength in numbers, mankind has developed the humanoid weapons known as TSFs, deploying them on the front lines to an anti-Beta war all across the globe. However, mankind still lost a majority of Eurasia to the superior numbers of the marching Beta. For nearly 30 years, mankind has remained bogged down in a struggle against the Beta with no hope in sight. So um, you do get kind of like this... Um, you know, this catch up and you find out that the year is actually 1999 when this is taking place. Um, and you find out, like it says that all of Eurasia has almost, uh, pretty much, uh, fallen. I think that at the beginning, they even tell you that the population has been decreased to around 2 billion humans, um, which is quite the tragic loss, at least in the nineties to be, to be sure. Um, and then the beta kind of begin to invade Japan and they overrun pretty much half the Island. Um, they, uh, humanity kind of developed the TSFs, like it says, which are large mechas and they come back the beta, but it's still kind of like a losing battle. And the episode takes place in what they call Soto Gashima, which I think is, uh, the northeastern side of the island. Now I got a little confused that I haven't rewatched the episode, but I believe they say that I like from what I watched, it felt like the other, like the western side of the island had already fallen, and this is what's that what's left. But when I was rewatching the episode a little bit, um, it seemed like the invasion actually started in Soto Gashima, and it's making its way to where they're at, and they're kind of like the last wall of defense, and then the rest of Japan will essentially be open because she, um, um. Uh, Sayoko makes a comment to one of the people that she's just like, oh, if we fall, then Tokyo and Yokohama will be, um, you know, at risk to the beta invasion. So it makes me think that maybe this was kind of like the last wall of defense. Like they invaded from the eastern side, from the northeastern side, and is making their way. But I don't know. Uh, I got a little confused there. So, um, but... As the episode kind of progresses around the halfway mark, maybe even not even maybe like a 25% mark, that's when the invasion really starts and you really get to see this gruesome battle take place. Um, you kind of see like the battle kind of shifts and you get to see the chain of command. You get to see a lot of like the main officers and you get to see our, our Soyoko kind of battle. But I would say that you get to see a lot more of others instead of Sayoko in the battle because like the entire episode just kind of turns into this person dies, this person dies, this person dies. And you know, like the battle actually kind of goes well for, for some of it. And then they just get completely overwhelmed. And one character in particular, the way that they died was probably the most gruesome thing I've ever seen in which that they take down um, one of the big boys and they get pinned underneath them. And you think that they got crushed to death, but they're actually alive. And then um, the thing's blood is like acid and it starts to seep in and he just gets like he just pretty much gets consumed by acid like like he just dies even though he survived that and he was going to get out like it was just probably the worst way to go man it was really intense and I, I would say that 
a lot of the episode really focuses, like I said, on people essentially just getting overwhelmed and dying just to show you how strong the beta are and how overwhelming the force is. And of course, um, Sorogashima essentially falls and um, Sayoko essentially kind of evacuates this one character who I think actually becomes a main cast later on, um, who is a civilian that she saw at the beginning of the episode who was with her grandfather. And she and very few people actually survive. They get escorted to a boat and they get off with Sayoko's uh, commander dying in the chain of command. Despite having the ability to get on a ship, they decided not to. They decided to just, you know, honorably die in this and lose this battle, which was kind of touching and sad at the same time. Like I said, this is a very sad episode um, with the deaths and whatnot that happened. I was I was pretty shocked, to be honest. Um but yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much how the first episode goes. Like it lets you know that Japan, the rest of Japan has fallen, and that there's 36 million people dead or missing, and that Sorogashima became the site of the 21st Beta Hive, meaning that the Beta created um, a hive to create more Betas and whatnot. So that's how the episode ends, and you're actually not even really sure where the refugees are going, or like. Um, the, I believe at one point in the episode, they say that they've contacted the U.S. and have received like no response back. So I don't know if this means that they're just moving towards a different part of Japan, like, you know, maybe like the Western tip where they are going to regroup and fight. Or if it means that they're just going to a different nation altogether and will eventually try to take Japan back. But I'm very interested. I mean, not being familiar with the franchise um has really helped me kind of enjoy this even though you know like i said some of the animation and some of the cg, CG could have been done a little bit better it's not too bad it's not x arm bad it's not um tesla note bad um it's just uh it, it's just okay i would say um but the actual mechs and stuff the tsfs that they use are really cool and i, I would love to buy a gunpla kit and, and build it but um as i was reading reviews online uh, not reviews, but people kind of talking about it. They said that the Gunplas for uh, Mavlove, like you have to put in a lot of work to get the detail done where Gunpla, like a lot of the engineering is just really already done for you. You don't really have to go the extra mile to do detail. So that's pretty much it for this review, guys. I really think you should check out Mavlove Alternative. I think that it's a really good one. Um, besides that, I have a few more first episodes to kind of review. Like I'll be doing uh, Digimon Ghost Stories, maybe. I will do Maruku-chan because they did a review of the manga. And I will review this one anime, which I forgot the name of, which uh, kind of sounded a lot like, uh, like kind of like it really inspired by uh, Gurren Lagan. So I'll get back to y'all with those videos next week, but there should be a manga review next week, as well as some extra videos like news updates and whatnot. So I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.